Hello, fellow foodies. I'm Dr. Cassandra Quave, your host for Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious. This week, we're going to dive into the business of herbal medicines, dietary supplements, and all of the different ways that medicinal plants enter into the marketplace. Our guest this week is Dr. Anne Ambrecht, the director of the Sustainable Herbs Program under the auspices of the American Botanical Council. She's a writer, and she also obtained her PhD in anthropology from Harvard in 1995. Her work explores the relationships between humans and the earth, most recently through her work with plants and plant medicine. She's the co-producer of the documentary Newman, The Nature of Plants, and the author of the award-winning ethnographic memoir, Thin Places, A Pilgrimage Home, based on her research in Nepal. Her latest book, which we're gonna be featuring today, is The Business of Botanicals, exploring the healing promise of plant medicines in the global industry. Thanks so much for coming on the show, Anne. Thanks so much for having me. It's great to be here. Well, it's great to meet you. And I just want to say congratulations on a lovely book. I've really enjoyed it. Um, And there was a particular line in the early section of the book that really grabbed me as I began reading. And it was, when and how had medicine become a product to buy instead of a skill we could share? And so maybe this is a good place to start and kick off our conversation. What inspired you to write The Business of Botanicals? So there's so many different ways I could go at that question, you know, because you picked that quotation, what it makes me think of is that question that the means are the end. And and that's very much what I learned in studying herbal medicine with Rosemary Gladstar at Sage Mountain. It's really the relationship with the plant and the intention that we brought as students to learning about them and to making remedies and all of those things. And, so, and that's what I explored in our film, Newman. But then as we were doing the interviews for Newman, interviewed a number of people in the botanical industry. And what struck me was about the real difference between that intention and the relationship and the, and the process and that that was kind of the healing, as much healing as the chemical constituents in the product But then those plants were bought and sold in this global supply chain Mm -hmm. that people didn't really seem to know a lot about. And so I was struck by that disconnect. And and it was also at a time when people in the herb community weren't talking so much about how medicines were made, herbal products were made. They would recommend certain companies. And then that was as far as it really went. So I wanted to dig in and find out more. That's great. When you give a great example of just going through the grocery store and thinking about where different food products come from. And I do the same thing. I'm always like, well, where was this great? Was it, was it, you know, grown in a sustainable way? Was it, you know, um, grown in a way that was good for local people and for their local economies? And do we see similar problems in the market for herbs? Are people um, compensated justly for their contributions to these product lines? So the, so to back up mm-hmm. before trying to not answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought this would be this simple project. I'll follow herbs through the supply chain and tell the stories of the people and plants behind the finished product, kind of with the idea that, well, the first step that knowing and seeing those people and their livelihoods was was kind of the first step to taking action. But what I found is it's really hard even to do that. It's Mm. to see, to get down to who is collecting, you know, nettles or meadow sweet or growing chamomile in Egypt, you know, all of that layer is quite hard to reach. And so to answer your question, there, Well, and it's hard to reach for a whole bunch of different reasons. One is kind of the history of the industry, which is built around secrecy and a lack of transparency, both for protecting sourcing, you know, so for company reasons. Also, because the media doesn't always kind of likes to paint the botanical industry in very black and white terms. It's either the answer to everything or Mm -hmm. it's all a fraud. And, and it's neither, you know, it's both, you know, as I'm sure all the speakers on your 
podcast talk about, you know, and it depends on the quality and it depends on how those products are sourced. And so some companies, they are doing, trying to support rural livelihoods and take care of over harvesting. And some have no idea where the plants are from and the workers live in tin shacks and can't afford health care for their kids, you know, so it's the yeah. whole gamut. That's a really good point. Well, and I think to understand quality, maybe we should stop for a moment and discuss what determines quality in an herbal product. If I grow chamomile in country A or wild harvest it in country B, you know, how does that influence the quality of the herb? Yeah, that's a good question. And it's also, you know, there are different levels. So, well, you know, there's a chemical constituent in measuring what can be measured and that can depend. It doesn't stop at just the plant. It has to do with the soil. And, and that's both how the soil is being cared for, but it's also then, you know, the, the way that in traditional systems that particular species growing in particular regions those are the ones that have been used in those traditional systems, say of Tibetan medicine or Ayurveda. Or, and so, so there's that dimension, right? That plants, mm -hmm. that quality that's defined in the parameters of that system of medicine. And then, the, you know, there's things around when it's harvested and how it's harvested and all of that kind of quality control. What I'm trying to talk about in this book also is broadening it beyond just the chemicals that go into the final product, finished product, but really to say that we can't be well unless every step of that process is well. And so, yes, it matters that the constituents are in the product we purchase, but it also matters that the ecosystem is being taken care of and that the people are taken care of because that back to that point about the means are the end. So in herbal medicine, especially that shows up because if people aren't taking care of the botanicals, the raw material, then the constituents aren't gonna be as high. Mm -hmm. And then Joseph Brinkman, who has been a real leader in kind of bringing attention to issues around sustainability and sourcing and as he made clear early on when we interviewed him for Newman, he said, you know, if, if people aren't making a fair wage, they're more likely to cut corners, you know, so they'll put rocks in a sack or they'll, they won't, they'll over harvest in order to make more money. Whereas if they're getting a fair wage, they're more likely to follow good many good agricultural practices and collection practices there it's not inevitable but it's more likely yeah and so quality seems like this really simple thing but it's i see it's like these concentric circles that, which is why writing this book was so hard <laughs> yeah i can imagine because you know you're dealing with not only many different species but different parts of the world and also different means of of sourcing these materials we have medicinal herbs that are of course cultivated but there are many that are still collected primarily from the wild. Um, in my own research in the Balkans, I've seen time and again, local communities, they're paid pennies for, you know, massive amounts of herbs. And there's not always a, dis a distinction between species even. On my last trip to Albania, I, you know, was revisiting one of the communities I've worked in over a number of years. And I saw that there were local people collecting yarrow, but there were multiple species of yarrow, but they were all being bundled together um, and then sold to middlemen that then go to other, that drive it down the mountain to other middlemen. And then this gets passed on to another supplier. And then it ends up at some point in an herbal shop in Germany or the UK or the US, who knows, but it all originated there with those local people. Um, and so it, I don't think it's always an intentional thing. It's not as, it's not always, you know, the idea of putting rocks into something, but sometimes it's just also lack of botanical training, um, on the part of some locals when they collect, especially plants that they don't use themselves as medicine, but which are collected primarily for sale. Well, and one of the biggest 
threats, I think, to, and not just me thinking this, a lot of, you know, people who I spoke mm -hmm. with talked about to the long-term supply of botanicals from around the world is that the lack of the, the, that knowledge isn't being passed on to younger generations mm -hmm. and younger generations are moving to cities. Yeah. You know, somebody from um, who I was speaking with, who's in charge of sourcing for a company in the U.S. said, when we came back from Eastern Europe, he said, so where were the young people? Did you see any young people? And he answered before I could say anything. He's like, no, you didn't because they're not there. They're moving to the cities. Mm -hmm. And so that get, which gets to the question of livelihood because every parent, you want your kids to have a good livelihood and a good living. And if they aren't getting able to do that, then in addition to the bright lights in the urban, you know, of an urban, yeah. there's always going to be people who want to live in rural areas, right? But you also want to have a dignified living. And what does that include? Absolutely. Well, this, this ties into another topic that you cover in the book. It's this concept of fair wild. So many of the listeners have probably never heard of this term before. Can you tell us what is fair wild? And is that similar to fair trade? So fair wild is a certification. And, and so it's similar to fair trade in that it's a certification. It's a third party certification for plants that are wild harvested. And the, it's quite rigorous. And there are you know, a whole set of criteria that a company has to go through to show that the plants aren't being over harvested. And so that's not as simple as it seems. And I'm not an ecologist. And so I only understand a little bit, but that has to look into how much is being harvested, how much is regenerate, regenerating. So there's a whole set of practices to, and you know, measures for that. And then there's a guidelines for social and economic aspects. And that's where the fair trade comes in. And so that's giving a slightly higher price for plants that are harvested fair wild with the idea that it takes more work on their part as well as you know, helping to support rural livelihoods. And then there's a fair wild premium, which is an investment back into the community. And that is decided by the community and it can go for different things. That's great, that's great. Um, do, you, do you have any examples of plants that are, that are um, harvested in this way from your travels? Yeah, so we visited the first, so when I first started this project and I wanted to follow herbs to the source mm -hmm. and it was quite hard to get people willing to let me visit because as I said before it's not there's not a lot of transparency and there's a lot of fear of losing suppliers you know other companies stealing your suppliers mm -hmm. and there's a lot of fear of kind of showing the dirty laundry because there's a fair amount of dirty laundry in this industry you know mm -hmm. that that of really bad practices. And so I was able to get some inroads because some fair wild producer groups in Hungary and then Poland were willing to let me visit. Mm -hmm. And I think in part they were willing to let me visit because they were used to being, having visitors and auditors come. And also because people from the Fair Wild Foundation were open to it because very few companies are by fair wild ingredients and so they need more okay. publicity. So mm -hmm. I would and so there are some companies in Hungary and then one in Poland, Runo. And it was interesting because one of the ingredients is dandelion, which is obviously not what we think of as an over harvested plant. But the idea there is that biodiverse meadows are threatened. And so by, and again, I'm not an ecologist and so I can't really describe it really well, but but by harvesting, by supporting wild, um, fair wild harvested dandelion root, that's providing an income to keep that meadow intact rather than just over harvesting the meadow, extracting it for one thing, it's seen the whole ecosystem. Then another um, quite interesting project that we visited was in, in, in the Western Ghats in India. So that's in on the Western sort of midway down the coast, some fair wild certified projects that have been um, put into place with the help of Pukka Herbs, a UK tea company. It, it, the, with, and they have been doing it 
or two um, bibitaki and haritaki, which are fruits that are in Trifala. So the bibitaki is harvested from a tree, which is where the hornbill nests. And so the idea, and, and those trees are being cut down for the logging industry in India. And so the idea of this project is that by providing more money for the collectors from the bibitaki, that's an incentive to keep the tree standing. And so Farewa, you know, it's this quite complex effort in this rural community to really make this work, but through the support of PAKA and then some funding from the UK, that these projects have been going for a while. And this, and an Indian uh, Applied Environmental Research Foundation is the NGO that kind of helps set up the smaller companies that make it all happen. I, I, I tell the story in here. <laughs> That's great. That's great. So I love this concept. It's not just about sustainable harvest of the species that is the, the, the focus of the, of the food product, the supplement or tea product, but in fact, it's the entire ecosystem in which that species is found, whether it is other herbs in a meadow or birds that are threatened because of deforestation. That's fascinating. That's really great. So, so, okay, can I oh, just, years yes. ago this, um, so I'm an anthropologist, mm -hmm. cultural anthropologist, so, uh, and very focused on kind of individual stories rather than big systems, but a quotation by the literary theorist Raymond Williams always stuck out, stood out to me when he's talking about in his book, The Country and the City, and he says, the coal is just as much a product of mining as the slag heap is but we just tend to focus on the coal mm -hmm. and not the whole process. Or Martha Herbert, when a neuroscientist, when we interviewed her for Newman, she was talking about side effects and she said, they're not side effects. She was talking about environmental toxins and she said, they're not side effects. They're effects. We just don't want to see them. They're not the ones we want. And so that's what it feels like. Something like Fair Wild is helping to support and nourish the effects that we do want, you know, beyond just this little product, one product. That's great. Well, we've seen some examples now of how, how companies can do it right, but what happens when they do it wrong? <laughs> what are some examples of some of the poor practices that really need to be remediated in the, in the industry? Yeah. So early on in this project, I also had to make a decision about what my focus was going to be and how much of the, the bad practices I would share. And, and part of that was how, you know, people were trusting me. And I, and I never from the beginning wanted to be this investigative journalist, I really wanted to do it more as an anthropologist and really understand the industry from the perspective of the different stakeholders. And so that's understanding the challenges and the work that's being done in a good way and the work that's being done in a bad way. And so I had to just, so, and also originally, even the first draft of the manuscript, it was kind of an overview of the whole industry. I went through each of the steps from the source to the finished product. And that included kind of, these are the bad practices and these are the more positive practices. And it was, it didn't work as a book and it wasn't interesting to write. So it would be really not interesting <laughs> to read, right? If it was putting me, <laughs> but so I revised it and focused around the encounters that I felt like were making a difference. I'll get to your question, but mm -hmm. that meant really framing that within a context of what is not working, what the bad things are. And so I described some, a few of those encounters in India. I mean, there was a lot, so much that we saw in India that was quite discouraging as I'm sure things you saw in Albania and the Balkans, but just careless carelessness, not knowing the species, mixing the species. Uh, one of the worst, I think everywhere is probably drying, you know, drying and storage. And so visiting some, this one warehouse off this dusty road and southern India with just huge piles of dried leaves and on a, um, the stem and the it was a trader who bought these from growers or wild collectors 
wild collecting there. You know, when we think of wild collecting, I think pristine forest, but this isn't pristine forest. This is, you know, like along a roadside in Southern mm. India, which, you know, who knows what factories are nearby or the quality of the air or the quality of the yeah. water. And so he had this store there and it was dry and dusty and brown. And I was there with an Indian botanist and she asked him who, who he sold this to. And, and he said, he was telling us, and he said he also had some better quality that was stored somewhere else. And she asked, well, which did he give to people? And he said, well, he would give them this, the poor quality. And if they asked for the better quality, then he'd mix them. <laughs> so there are just so many or another example of a yeah. warehouse in India where it's just all these open sacks and people reaching their hands in to take you know out samples for buyers and so little awareness about what was getting mixed in between the different sacks or like rodents at night or you know just or mold from, or from mold. wet and yeah yeah and fluctuating temperature so the constituent I mean mm -hmm. yeah and yeah. So One thing that struck me um, in your writing about your early training with herbs was, you know, the reverence and respect for herbs and, and how they are collected and processed. And, um, you know, in my, in my research lab, we apply many of the same techniques with really taking great care and how we collect the herbs, where we collect them from. You can't collect herbs from a roadside or from an area where you have waste runoff or, you know, exposure to pesticides and herbicides, because that can really affect the chemistry and interfere with our scientific experiments. But when it comes to, you know, collecting herbs for consumption that people are going to be taking into their bodies and sometimes at like pretty high doses. If you're taking a lot of these supplements all the time, that can really um, create some problems if they're exposed to, you know, mercury or road runoff or who knows what other kind of toxins there are in the environment. Um, and so I could, I could see how seeing those conditions would really be alarming. <laughs> well, okay. no, yeah. And a first step of in writing this book was I think part of the journey of the research was my becoming less naive about, okay, if people want herbs on a global scale, what does that really mean yeah. to, to, man to grow them? You know, what kind of mechanization? You know, I kind of, I live in central Vermont. I like grow your own. <laughs> yeah. But, but, and so it was understanding, like opening my eyes somewhat. And also I think, for the for consumers and people who use herbal products first to really understand the industry and understand the challenges rather than just going in and criticizing it because it, yeah. it can be really easy to criticize and so it's understanding the challenges and understanding the companies that are trying to are committed to doing it right Absolutely. Because there, there definitely are companies that have people where that's their entire job is, is sourcing control and really, you know, working with local providers and suppliers to ensure that they, that they're able to, to supply um, quality ingredients. Well, let's talk a bit about scale. Um, I think this year is, you know, scale has become an issue to say the least, because we've seen tremendous growth in the botanical supplement industry and in the desire for more herbal teas and herbal supplement products um, in our search for ways to boost our immune health and, and just have, you know, fortify our bodies um, to protect ourselves from, from infection and from, you know, other uh, chronic diseases as well. And this put a lot of strain on the, on the entire supply chain. Um, I know recently there were some re um, press releases around adulteration of like elderberry, which has been something that people have been taking a lot of um, for immune health. What did you What did you learn from this investigation around supply and and kind of scalability of the market? Yeah, that's such an ongoing question and challenge, and especially more so lately. I think. So again, I went in with ideas about scale and assumptions that weren't necessarily the right ideas and assumptions. But what I think I took was 
took away was what matters is not necessarily scale. It matters, the, the attention matters. If you can make sure that you are paying, there are people paying attention at each level, then scale, you know, it, it, you can grow in that way. I think that gets increasingly hard when in periods of rapid growth, like mm -hmm. right now and demand and every, so at Sustainable Herbs Program, we've had a series of webinars, several of which are looking exactly at that impact of the increase in demand for companies who do have a commitment to responsible sourcing, but then they face these pressures like on the grocery store shelf, what if we go out of stock? What are the implications of that? And and um, Marin, who is in charge of sourcing, one of the people at sourcing at Paca Herbs, talked a lot about the challenges they were facing as a company as they were growing fast, that they needed to find suppliers, so producer groups from mm -hmm. companies around the world who could grow at the same speed, had the capacity. And so it was the so that you know that and he he gave the example of clothing, you know, you don't just buy size two clothes for your two-year-old child, you want to get <laughs> a little bit bigger so they can grow into them. Yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. So it's not just about scale and the ability of the, what we think of as the herbal suppliers or our product suppliers, the companies that, that transform the raw ingredients into a final product, but it's also really important to think about the suppliers on the ground level that are actually engaging directly with the herbs, because it's, if I'm, if, correct me if I'm mistaken, but most of the supplement companies don't grow their own herbs. They, they source it from different suppliers across the globe. Yeah, I think, and, and I think that was the biggest surprise for me was how, how disconnected the supply mm -hmm. really is and how there are producer groups, which means the people who often purchase the herbs that are grown by yet another mm -hmm. collection of people and then harvesters are different. And then there are those producer groups and they sell to someone else who sell to someone else. And, and then often the finished product is manufactured by contract manufacturers in the US. And then the label we see is just the brand. And so that, so back to your question of scale, I think scale can be okay as long as there's a connection all the way back down. But I think what happens is companies scale up and then it gets easier to hand over more of that decision-making around sourcing to an ingredient supplier mm -hmm. and then, and trusting them. And so there's not that direct connection with the producers on the ground which, you know, is happening with a, a, a lot of more companies that, again, the, the, the ones that started out smaller by herbalists, as they're growing and becoming more successful, they become more distant from that direct right. connection. That direct connection to making the products or growing and making the products. Was, was that the thing that was the most surprising to you um, in, in researching and writing this book? I think it was most discouraging to me. I mean, I think, you know, I came uh, really believing in grassroots medicine and, and that, and I, I don't know that it has to be grassroots medicine. I think you can bring really high quality things on a different scale, but that it's so fragmented and so, you know, going to Supply Side West, I think, you know, is probably the, mo the most surprising and the scale of, and the money that's being made in certain areas and the money that's not being made in other areas. You know, I, last week we had a, 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 a webinar for the Sustainable Herbs Program with three different growers. Mm -hmm. And one was an Italian company, Avoca, which is vertically integrated and it's certified organic and a B Corp. And he said, yeah, uh, the, the person who was speaking about it, their agro, sorry, their agronomist said that because they control from the seed to the finished product, they see all the impacts that they're having and that allows them to be, to respond to those better and to be more responsible. Mm 
And so I think the examples, and there are not many that I found most inspiring were where there was that integration. It was, and it, there were several in Eastern Europe, one in Hungary and one in Poland, where it was a center where they manufactured herbs and there was an education center, there was a botanical garden. And there, this one in Poland was this big, vital, there was a hotel and all these young Polish wow. families were there. So it was a, a big tourist destination for people from the cities. And it was amazing. That's and they, they weren't producing for a global market. It was a domestic market. And so that allowed them to have their own quality control standards, but they didn't have to deal with a lot of the difficulties of exporting and things like that. Yeah, that's fascinating. I really like this idea of vertical integration. And well, let's talk a bit about exports too. Um, and this is a this is a subject that's really touchy in the in the pharmaceutical market around botanical medicines, and we've seen great you know examples of implementation of Nagoya protocols with, for example, with um, with crophelomir, um, with the product made from the dragon's blood tree, and how the company is uh, real shaman pharmaceuticals is really working to um, bring benefits back to local people and working with local people. Um, but we don't always see those same expectations for some reason in the in the supplement market, which is surprising to me because this is a multi-billion with a B <laughs> dollar market. And um, it's entirely based on, on botanicals that have, in most cases, a very rich history of traditional knowledge and in local use as, as their own form of plant-based medicine in many of the countries where these products originate. Um, in your discussions with companies, did you ever hear anything um, about this concept from them? Well, so in the U.S., companies are, are not super educated about the Nagoya Protocol and all of that, and mm -hmm. sort of woefully inadequately so. I think I in the, have a chapter where I talk about the, a visit I did to traditional medicinals projects in Rajasthan, mm -hmm. which is different than what you're saying, because Senna is not necessarily a traditional medicine that's used by, so it's not necessarily a cultural Mm -hmm. proper, you know, intellectual property, but there is the, the fact that if traditional medicinals is making money on this plant, their supply is depending on that, that both it makes business sense, but also it's the right thing to do to invest in those communities. Mm -hmm. And so in that chapter, it's really looking at how they've gone about doing that, seeing that you can't just go extract some the you yeah. know this raw material and then make billions of dollars it has how to build in some kind of reciprocity and it's hard it's hard you know it's yeah hard to do That's and other hard. companies are doing similar things and and there's also actually a lot more conversations that I've been having now with the sustainable herbs program and with other people at companies who are thinking really critically and hard about living income and wage and livelihood and how to kind of balance, you know, where, who's making the money. That's, that's great. Well, and tell us a bit more about the sustainable herbs program. This is a program that you initiated. Um, what year did you start the program and um, where can the audience find out more about it or tune into these webinars? So I started this. So this project started when I wanted to write a book and follow herbs to the supply chain. And as I said, I went to Eastern Europe and visited the Fair Wild projects. And as I was there, I thought, wow, this would make really good short videos to, to, because it was amazing to see a processing company. You know, I didn't even know what primary processing meant. And so, or collecting or those steps. And so, and I realized to do that would be much quicker than writing a book. And so I came back and launched a Kickstarter campaign and raised $60,000, which was quite surprising, you know, great. And it was largely from like 30 or $40 donations, largely from the US herb community, I think, because I, that to me was a sign people really want this information and yeah. want to know that they're buying, when they're buying something, it's gonna be good for them and it's gonna be good 
for the people along the way. So, so that with that funding, my husband, who's a filmmaker, and I went and did more. We visited more companies, more, you know, went to India with Paka, and then I went back to India as a Fulbright for six months and did more filming. And with that material, we created the Sustainable Herbs Program, which is a multimedia website. And originally it was directed at consumers with, you know, sort of storytelling behind the scenes of where herbs come from. And I was looking for a long-term home for that. And around that time, we spoke with Mark Blumenthal from American Botanical Council, and we came up with the idea of it becoming a program of American Botanical Council. And so, and so what that did is it brought it to a different platform. There's now, in addition to providing content for consumers, we're really working to engage the industry in conversations. You know, there's a lot of companies saying they're sustainable and now regenerative practices, you know, everybody's regenerative, right? But what does that really mean? And sort of how do you open that up? And, and so we're doing that in a variety of ways. We've created this toolkit which is kind of as a collection of best practices around sustainable and regenerative practices in the botanical industry. You know, there's so much information out there. There's not so much that's directed specifically to sourcing botanicals. So, so that was what that was. And then, and then a year ago we started, well, in the last September, we started doing these webinars, which are twice a month of really bringing together conversations around key issues in sourcing botanicals, mm -hmm. as well as a series on ethnobotany. And we have many similar speakers to your podcast. It's great. That's great. That's great. Well, this is such a, an important resource, like you said, just not only for consumers, but also for um, students and folks in the industry, because it is a complex interest industry. There are so many different layers and levels from, you know, across the supply chain to the formulations to batch to batch standardization to how they're grown harvested it's it's a really um complex process so i think it's fantastic that that you're bringing um this information um out to people um do you have any other tips also for the consumers how do they determine if they're buying the best products um, when it comes to these botanicals yeah, that's such a good question. And everybody always wants to know what companies do I buy from? And I'm not going to tell you. Um, I think in, on, on one way to tell or a place to begin is on the Sustainable Herbs Program website, we have donors, the list of companies that have made a decision to invest and support Sustainable Herbs Program. That's a sign that those are companies that are committed beyond lip service in these mm -hmm. issues. And so that's a good place to start, I think. So that's an indirect way of recommending companies, but a lot of those aren't brands, they're ingredient suppliers and behind the scenes. I think another thing, so back to the first point you made around the process of making medicine mm -hmm. as a skill, like to me, that's what drew me to herbal medicine because I realized how empowering it was to regain that knowledge and not just be dependent on what someone told me. Yeah. And so what I'm trying to do in writing this book is really bring people behind the scenes so that everybody knows what questions to ask and what to look for and to think about, okay, what values matter to me? Like I really wanna support rural farmers and smallholder farmers in India. Mm -hmm. Then I can find a company that's really committed to that or if I really care about growing domestically in the US, then I can find companies that that's more of their priority so that it's not just a one size fits all. This is the best company. There's a, a lot of different approaches. Well, not a lot, but you know, a, 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 a number of different approaches. And so I feel like defining the things that you care about and then finding the companies that are committed to that and then think of supporting like your purchase of their products help them do that work more mm -hmm. so it's not just about how can this make me be well but really how can i support wellness all along the supply chain by helping this company know that i'll be a i'll buy their 
so buy their products. So one of the other surprising thing is, you know, companies that are are doing really good work around sustainability and all that, but they have like 15 people in marketing and two people in sourcing. Wow. Because they need to compete on the grocery store shelf. You know, mm-hmm. I can understand kind of, yeah. but mm-hmm. if we as consumers could help them shift that balance, like you don't need to market so much to us, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you can put that money in the supply in sourcing. That's I don't great. know. I haven't really gone very far with that idea, but it seems like a good one. That's great. No, I mean, and I, I love thinking about this from a global perspective and, you know, having, having these experiences of meeting local harvesters, um, which you and I have shared with, you know, in different parts of the world, it really brings it home that these are people's livelihoods. This is what sustains their families and um, having this done in a really socially just and equitable way is, is so important um, at multiple levels. Um, one last thing I, I, just to return to this idea also of our connection to medicine and how medicine is about sharing knowledge too. You know, I think, uh, many of the listeners in the audience, um, have, uh, small gardens, or maybe it's a balcony garden with some potted herbs. And I wonder if you could just share with us some simple tips on making medicines. I'm a big fan of mint tea just to start us off. And so I grow mint in my garden and I, you know, when it's ready, I cut it, I dry it. And then I have this delicious, you know, mint tea that I can make for myself and my kids um, throughout the year. Um, It's so simple to make some of these types of, of, of medicines. Can you, can you give us some other tips? Um, I'm a very small home scale herbalist, not a teaching herbalist, but I, things I do, yeah, I harvest nettles mm-hmm. and dry them. And from the beginning, from when my kids were young, you know, I dry them and I fill it, put them in a mason jar and pour hot water over it and steep it overnight. And mm. I give that to my kids and they've grown up drinking nettles tea. And so I think, okay, I've done one healthy thing for them. <laughs> and then I like, you know, like, Echinacea, it's so easy to grow echinacea. Mm-hmm. And then just harvest it after a couple of years, two or three years, the root, clean it, chop it, cover it with vodka. That's my kind of medicine making. I'm not a high quality control. I mean, I'm quality control in terms of cleanliness and how I handle it, but not in terms of lab testing. <laughs> so. Yeah, no, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, it's amazing what you can do with a mason jar and some vodka. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want some plants. I've, in addition to making um, plant-based medicines, I love to make um, kind of home crafts for gifts. So this year I made a ridiculous amount of limoncello and it's such a simple process because basically it's taking the part of the plant that you want that's organically grown and you know, steeping it in vodka for a couple of weeks and you go back and voila, you have your, your materials. You just needed to decant the, uh, the liquid separate the plant material and the liquid and there you have your tincture that you can use for many different things it touches on such an interesting question around cost and price because on one hand mm-hmm. around sourcing you know people who aren't making enough money and yet botanical medicines are said to be cheaper and more affordable but it can be quite expensive if you're buying a lot of single tincture bottles you, absolutely you know. mm-hmm. and so that's another question I, I, I don't have an answer for, but I, I feel like the more we can all make our own, then it can be unaffordable. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Well, I want to just thank you, Anne, again, for sharing this book. Again, for the audience, it's called The Business of Botanicals. It's out this, um, it was just out this year. It's available with all of your major booksellers. Um, and you can find out more about your work and the Sustainable Herb Program. Is it at sustainableherbsprogram.org? Um, you also have your author website at annambrecht.com. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm excited to, to learn more about this. And I've been tuning into some of the webinars. And they've been fantastic. So thank you for sharing those. Yeah, they've been great. That's great. Well, thanks again. 
You've been listening to Foodie Pharmacology, the science podcast for the food curious recorded on Zoom during the COVID-19 isolation period. Um, If you'd like to find this and other episodes, you can go to our website at foodiepharmacology.com. You can also find the video version of this at our YouTube channel at Teach Ethnobotany under the Foodie Pharmacology playlist. I want to send a shout out of thanks to our producers, to Rob Cohen and Christine Roth and Co-Conspiracy TV for their help with producing this and all of our other awesome episodes. Thanks so much for listening. Stay healthy out there and I'll see you next time.